So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Fabrizio Del Monte, who's here with us now in Montreal, even though we don't get to meet very much. Uh, he finished his doctorate uh, under the supervision, I think it was Tanzini, or was it both Tanzini and Bonelli? Both Tanzini and Bonelli. Uh, in uh, Trieste. Uh, and uh, he's done some very interesting work. Uh, as it's announced, uh, he's going to talk about that uh, partly in collaboration with uh, with uh, Gavrilenko and, uh, well, I don't see Lisovi's name here, but I think it's also inspired by Lisovi's work. So uh, for those who are not familiar with it, there's a really terrific development that took place over the last seven or eight years, which in some sense you could say uh, completely solved uh, at least Panlevé 6 and uh, some other Panlevé equations. Of course, uh, what does it mean completely solved? Uh, he'll describe that better. But uh, it means, of course, uh, very explicit uh, series representations in which all the coefficients are completely determined in terms of the monodromy data and, the, uh, and some combinatorial factors. And what uh, Fabrizio did in his thesis was, I mean, all the work done by this group over the last seven or eight years, uh, most of it was aimed at uh, just punctured spheres uh, different ranks, different number of punctures, but basically uh, uh, essentially a, ra a rational isomonodromic systems. And uh, so naturally one asks what happens when uh, the punctured sphere is replaced by another Riemann surface. And that's what um, Fabrizio is specialized in and he'll tell us about it now. Thank you, Fabrizio, it's yours. Thank you, John, for the introduction and for covering the first few slides of the talk. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, today I'll tell you about this work that I did in collaboration with my PhD advisors, uh, Giulio Bonelli and Alessandro Tanzini, as well as Pasha Gavrilenko and Harini Desiagio. Alisa V, of course, was uh, an influential figure, but I haven't actively collaborated with him on these. And the setting uh, that what I'll tell you about um, is uh, is in uh, is that of this isomonodromic CFT gauge theory correspondence, and this this field uh, this line of research was initiated by the seminal paper by Kamayun Yorgo Belisovi in 2012, where they showed that uh, the tau function of the six Panlevé equation can be written as a free fermion conformal block. And this uh, observation was lately uh, uh, proven uh, rigorously in several ways and extended to other cases. And uh, importantly there, uh, the, it was shown also that everything uh, that they said can be reformulated uh, directly in terms of the Riemann-Hilbert approach. And in this uh, setting, the tau function is uh, directly uh, defined as a freedom determinant of some cauchy lemelli operators. And so, uh, but, but the minor expansion uh, that one gets from this uh, freedom determinant coincides with the expansion one gets from the free fermions. So this is a, an, an independent confirmation uh, that doesn't use CFT methods. And then in fact, this whole story has a, a much broader uh, generalization that encompasses also uh, Q discrete uh, equations, Q Panlevé, and then uh, it relates to topics in uh, uh, mirror symmetry, um, BPS states of Calabi-Yau, but I will not touch on this other uh, part of this correspondence. I just wanted to mention it, mention that it exists at the beginning. And the general idea of this talk will be to show you how these results uh, that were obtained in the correspondence with uh, especially free fermions uh, between isomonodromic deformation and free fermion conformal blocks can be extended uh, to the case of genus greater or equal than one. And these two approaches that exist, uh, we, we dealt with both, uh, uh, both these approaches, both the free fermion uh, those were works in collaboration with 
uh, Bonelli and Tanzini and Gabrielenko, and uh, the operator theory sites, which was in collaboration with the Siraggio and Gabrielenko. And today I will focus mostly on the free fermion approach, but I will show you also some of the results we obtain uh, using operators. And these are the main results specifically uh, that the isomonodromic tau function, uh, if you're not familiar with this, of course, I will introduce everything uh, in more detail in a few slides, but uh, the isomonodromic tau function for on Riemann, for Fuchsian systems on Riemann surfaces with genus at least one, and then Fuchsian singularities is again uh, this free fermion conformal block that uh, was already in the case of the sphere, but there's an extra factor given by a twisted free fermion partition function. I'll, I'll explain what this uh, factor is, but uh, it's a, quite a transcendental extra factor that is not there on the sphere and originates by, because of the non-triviality of flat bundles on surfaces starting on genus one. But still, uh, from the conformal block, one gets uh, a combinatorial expansion, uh, which is written in terms of so-called Nekrasov functions. And this uh, gives also some correspondence with the four-dimensional gauge theories. And uh, I will show that this, uh, I, will sh I will not show how, but at least that if this arises from the minor expansion of a determinant that we define on the torus and everything is fully explicit. And this is the plan of the talk. I will start by introducing some uh, uh, basic notations and uh, uh, basic facts from uh, Fuchsian linear systems of ODEs and how they're generalized, uh, especially in the case of the torus. I will uh, focus myself mostly uh, to the torus case to be more explicit. And then I will um, introduce the free fermions. Uh, I will try to relate the free fermions that we use in this isomonodromic context with those that are uh, used in the context, of, for example, of integrable hierarchies. And I'll show how uh, the techniques that one uh, borrows from conformal field theories can be used to prove this relation between free fermions and isomonochromic tau functions. And finally, I will show you some of the results that we obtain on the torus and discuss some future per perspectives. So this, uh, let's start by recalling some definition. A Fuchsian linear systems of uh, ODs on the Riemann sphere is uh, just some object of this type where Y and L are both matrix valued functions and uh, L is uh, encodes the coefficients of the linear systems and it's the Lux matrix. Fuchsian means that L of Z has simple poles at the points Z, at some points ZK with residues that are some constant matrices AK. And is in the formulas- matrix, I guess you want to say square matrices. Yes, uh, these are all square matrices. And in fact, in the actual formulas, I will uh, write down the case in which they are in SL2, just uh, uh, so that the formulas are more legible, but um, most of what I'll say applies in the uh, more general case of SLM. And in this case, uh, we, we will take these uh, residues to have fixed conjugacy class. So the, the residues are parameterized by some numbers, theta k, uh, this sigma three is sigma Pauli matrix, and these theta k's are called local monodromy exponent. This is because the solution is, uh, because the Lux matrix has this simple pole, this, the solution will be a multi-valued function on the Riemann sphere with monodromies in fixed conjugacy classes determined by these parameters theta k's, which are the eigenvalues of the ak's. And these monodromy matrices uh, satisfy the monodromy relation on the Riemann sphere. So the product is the identity. And what we want to do here- When you say is, tilde, you mean conjugate too. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, yes. And uh, what we want to do here is to study the deformations of this linear system 
that keep these monodromies constant. And these are uh, well-known isomonodromic deformations that in this case uh, are given by the Schlesinger system. Uh, they can be written in this Lux pair form where one has this uh, other two by two matrices MZK. I apologize to using the same notation for the Lux pair and the, not exactly the same, but similar notation for the Lux pair and the monodromies, but we will not use the Lux pair uh, anywhere else. So um, it will not be very important because what is important for our description is instead the fact that these uh, deformations uh, are governed by uh, give some time evolutions parametrized by uh, where the times are the these positions of the poles and the time evolutions are generated by incompatible Hamiltonians the Schlesinger Hamiltonians and we can uh, obtain them by taking the residues of one half trace of L squared. Now compatibility of these Hamiltonians implies the local existence of a generating function, which we call the isomonodromic tau function. And this is our definition of the isomonodromic tau function as generating function for the Hamiltonians. So how do we uh, generalize this description to uh, the case of higher genus? Well, um, when uh, now we will have again, uh, a linear system of this form, but the requirement that L has uh, simple poles with uh, residues in fixed conjugacy classes um, in, at, at, the, at the poles uh, makes it so that L in general will not be uh, single valued. So the, the Lux matrix itself is multivalued. And in the case of genus one, uh, we can bring multivaluedness of the Lux matrix to this form. So we, we only have multivaluedness along the B cycle and this we will call the twists. So we have two types of multivaluedness for the solution. We have the usual- It's, it's, it's yes. multivalued, but uh, you're thinking of it as defined on a torus, it's multivalued. Yes. But it's- uh, Of course in the- in the universal coverage. Yes, it's, it's a single valid in the universal covering, that's correct. But, uh, well, uh, that's uh, kind of always true. Also in the case of the sphere, if I take the universal, universal covered of the puncture sphere, uh, it's single valid. But anyway, uh, yes, this is multi-valued on the torus, while in the case of the sphere, L was single valued on the sphere. And, but because L now is uh, multivalued, uh, we have these two types of uh, monodromies, the two, two types of multivaluedness on the solution. We have the usual monodromy uh, represented. Yes. Are you assuming a certain number of poles in each fundamental domain? I am assuming that all the poles are in the fundamental domain. This is why we have N uh, simple yeah, yeah. poles. But you're not putting any specific number. No, that they're just n. Uh, I take uh, uh, n Fuchsian singularities on the torus. I take it to be that there are n uh, simple poles of the Lux matrix in the fundamental domain. And uh, you see these uh, monodromy matrices that act on the right of the solution. They satisfy, they, they, they are the, your usual monodromy and satisfy the monodromy relation on the torus. But now you have this uh, kind of twisted monodromy representation on the B cycle, where you have also this matrix acting on the left of the solution. But nonetheless, we can still consider monodromic deformations of the system. And now the times are not just the positions of the singularities, but also the modular parameter of the torus. And uh, the the Hamiltonians uh, with respect to the singularities position uh, are again given by residues, but the one uh, for the for tau is given by an A cycle integral of one half trace of L squared. And sorry, the capital Q is uh, is the exponential. Uh, is that is that the exponential? So, right? No, 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 no. No, no. This is how is the relation between capital Q and tau? 
Capital Q uh, right now is just a parameter that is in the Lux matrix. I'll show you a concrete example in uh, the next slide. Uh, but it, it parameterizes the multivaluedness uh, of the Lux matrix. So it's just it a or complex parameter? For now, yes. Once you impose uh, isomonodromic, you will see we will see that uh, it is uh, it has a transcendental dependence on the time on tau. Um, and so you, you have these uh, Hamiltonians that you can define again by contour integration and the compatibility again gives you a definition of the isomonodromic tau function that we choose to be this one. And again, uh, one can generalize this description to the higher genus case, but uh, we would go into much technicalities, then the, the twists will be uh, along both all the A cycles and all the B cycles. Uh, to define the Hamiltonian, one has to contract with some Beltrami differentials, but I don't want to go into those details. I think that already but discussed. In addition it. to those discrete uh, uh, equations, you, you also have the usual uh, Schlesinger ones. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that uh, the, the deformations can be written in terms of uh, uh, Lux pair form, but we, we, we only uh, for uh, our discussion, we will only care that uh, uh, the Schlesinger equation can be recast in a Hamiltonian uh, time evolution with uh, respect to these Hamiltonians. Okay, but that's part of the dynamics, of course. Yes, yes. So the most basic example of, of this, uh, of all this, is the case of the one puncture torus. And in this case, the Lux matrix is that of the elliptical Ogero Moser uh, system. And you see uh, the simple pole uh, is given by this theta function in the denominator here. Um, this m is the monodromy exponent, but because we have also a theta function here in the numerator, we get this conjugation by q. So sorry, this is I, uh, how many how many particles? Is this an infinite uh, or a periodic or what kind of color drum? It's just the elliptical algebra Moser mod. This is uh, uh, two uh, two particles uh, on the torus, uh, ah, but they're at q minus q. Uh, it's, I, you didn't say it's just two particles. Yes, yes. Um, and the the then the, the isomonodromic deformation equation in this case, one can uh, write the Lux pair and uh, verify that it's given by this equation, which is a non-autonomous elliptical Ogero Moser equation, uh, which is a special case of the elliptic form of uh, pan levy 6. And so the periods, what, what are the alpha, beta, gamma, delta? So the alpha, the elliptic form of pan levy 6 uh, is um, d squared, uh, well, let's keep it, d squared q, d tau squared, Two pi i squared. So this is, this is just standard to... rational. I mean, this is the usual pan of a six. Just yeah. So elliptic uh, variables. Yes. So I'm asking what the four constants are. Yeah. So uh, this uh, alpha k can be written in terms of alpha beta gamma. I, I don't remember uh, right now exactly how they're related, but uh, uh, right here uh, to go from here to here. You set all the alpha k's to be equal. So these are the half periods. Yeah, but you're assuming what a linear relation between q and tau, or, or how are q and tau? Oh related? no, uh, this is uh, one has to go. So q, what do you mean through q and tau? Ah, no, okay. uh, through no, q no, it's because I'm and looking the at your Weierstrass p function, which has an elliptic uh, variable. And you're equating it uh, to two q, yeah. And uh, so you okay. So that's complete. That's very intrinsic. It's very implicit. The q is a function of tau. So both the elliptic and the modular variable are variable. Yes. Q is just uh, related to the pan, uh, pan levy six transcendent by an elliptic integral, basically. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's not quite. Well, I guess it is clear. The alpha should be something like. I mean, alphas alpha are, two, are three, linear four, combination four. of the alpha, beta, gamma, deltas. Yeah. 
is alpha case. But the two, three, four is zero, and the, the one is, is just n squared or something? No, no, it's uh, uh, alpha, uh, alpha one is equal to alpha two, alpha, uh, all the alphas are equal, and they're like n squared over four. Oh. And because here you have q. Uh, you see, here you have q, here you have two q, and then you use a doubling identity. But the, the, the only thing that uh, is relevant here is that you see this uh, twist that is acting on the solution of the linear system uh, on the left is, is very, has a very transcendental dependence on the time already in the simplest case. And this is the main difference uh, that will uh, uh, change with, re with respect to what happens in the case of the sphere. So uh, before going on uh, to the intro to introducing free fermions, uh, are there any more questions? Well, I'm just, just a little bit puzzled. I think it's probably obvious from your equations, but I mean, uh, the isomonogramic equations are non-autonomous. Kaloger yeah. Moser is autonomous. How do these two fit together? Yes, this is why I say that this is the non-autonomous elliptic Kaloger Moser. Because ah. the Lux matrix is the same. But oh. you see, the, in the non in the Kaloger Moser model, the equation would have been d squared q over dt squared, with the possibility of 2 pi i squared is equal to n squared by stress p prime of 2q. Oh. Tau. But now the tau is in the Lux matrix. So the uh, two particle interactions are time dependent. Yes. So yeah, this is uh, why it's not autonomous. So I'll go on. Uh, into introducing our free fermions. And uh, in this section, I will have two main goals. So the first goal will be to show you how one can uh, realize a generic monodromy representation on a Riemann surface by using the monodromy properties of free fermion conformal blocks in two dimensional conformal PTU. And, uh, and by, by Constructing this monotromy representation, we will be able to relate the conformal block to the solution of the linear system. And then uh, by using this uh, relation to the to y of z, uh, we will be able to recover the uh, relation with the tau function by going through the Lux matrix. So this is the setting uh, of twisted free fermions. These are the free fermion fields that you're probably all used to. They, the free fermion field has this uh, mode expansion uh, and its modes are operators that satisfy your Clifford algebra. And then you can, uh, you, you can uh, define your Clifford module by applying the raising operators on a vacuum. The vacuum is an annihilated by all the positive modes. And uh, so you, you apply negative modes of this uh, free fermion fields to the vacuum. And an arbitrary state that is uh, uh, in this Clifford module is labeled by a partition. This is because if we use the Clifford algebra here, we can reorganize an arbitrary string of negative modes in such a way that you get a product of psi bar with these pi that are non-decreasing, uh, non-increasing, non and the qi the same. And so this can be taken as Frobenius coordinate of a Yan diagram. So Sorry, the, P's and the, the pi's and the qi's, don't they have opposite signs? Oh, for you, it's the same. No, I, so yeah, you're psi you have a minus R, R is psi dagger minus R. Yeah, yeah. But are, are they of any sign? The PIQI can have it? Uh, no, they're all positive. Okay, good. Yeah. No, no, in your Y formula. The yes, PI these PIs and QIs are all positive. They're all positive. So uh, 
this is an example of how one can construct a Yan diagram starting from the PIs and the QIs. So the uh, in this in this example we have these PIs, and the these are the number of boxes to the right of the main diagonal of the Yan diagram. So you see here I have one, two, three, four and a half. So nine over two boxes, five over two, three over two. While the QIs are the number of boxes below uh, the main diagonal. So here again, nine over two, uh, five over two, and here we get only half a box. So this is how one represents an arbitrary fermionic state uh, through a Young diagram. And an important property of these free fermions is that uh, they generate a U1 hat current, al current algebra at level one uh, through this current. So you see, this is just a normal order product of uh, psi bar psi. And uh, the modes of this current generate a Heisenberg algebra. And so the, the vacuum that we uh, that was in the previous slide can be considered as the eigenstate of J0 with eigenvalue 0. But we can consider more general vacua uh, if we introduce the charge shifting operator that uh, has this uh, commutation relation with the currents. And then this allows us to define more general charged vacua, charged vacuum states by applying e to the aq, where a is some complex number, to the vacuum. And then you see this uh, uh, j0 uh, applied to, to such a state by using the commutation relation will have eigenvalue a. So this is the, uh, is the u1 charge, u1 hat charge of this state. And again, we can construct a charged Clifford module over such a state by applying the operators as before. But now this will be uh, labeled by a partition and this number A. And the reason why it's important in this construction to consider uh, this uh, um, charged Clifford modules is that they, uh, this parameter A allows us to uh, introduce multivaluedness in our description. And this we can see if we consider the bosonization formula for Psi. This, this formula is called bosonization because I'm expressing Psi uh, as exponential of the modes of the currents. And the currents are a bosonic field while Psi is a fermionic field. So you see in this formula, uh, I have this factor z to the j0. Now, when I act on the space ha uh, with this field, I will get a factor uh, of z to the a. So this factor j to the z to the j0 gives us a multivaluedness of this free fermion field when I do some loop around it. So z. could you say more exactly what the script ha denotes? So this means that so uh, this field here, uh, this is an operatorial statement. Uh, it's true in general. When I act on H A, this Z to the J zero gives you Z to the A. So this mode expansion is kind of true when I restrict to H A. In yeah, general, I can have another number here. I'm a little bit confused. So H A is part of the fer uh, of the uh, Fermi Fox space? H A is a Fermi Fox space, but is constructed over this this vacuum, which is different from zero. Ah, okay. So ah, so the, it's ah, very interesting. This is the twist. Is this the twist? Yes. Well, ah. not, not well. <laughs> it is a a twist. The the different twist than the ones on the Lux matrix. Okay. The, this will become the monotonous. Is, okay, uh, just, uh, I don't want to interrupt. I'm saying too much. But for those who are not completely familiar with these fermionic constructions, the usual Clifford algebra construction of a fermionic box space, uh, at least for this uh, one-dimensional problem, 
is as a semi-infinite exterior product space on whatever the first quantized Hilbert space is. So uh, in this case, you, you have an isomorphic copy of this for every A. Uh, so no, the, that, that slipping in of the non-integer A, because integer A is part of that. It's simply a yeah. fermion F, an integer fermionic eigenvalue. That, that's just part of that exterior product. But you're not doing that. You're ma you are building on a non-integer fermion uh, yeah. sort of lattice. And so you really have many isomorphic copies of the fermionic thick, uh, box space uh, in a strange way. I mean, there's some equivalences because I guess that A and A plus one are really the same space. Yeah, which is in fact the, the third line of the slides that oh, in, yeah, in yeah. fact, it is natural to consider A to be defined in C over Z so that your HA is actually a sum, direct sum over N of this HAN where H A N is uh, constructed over a vacuum, over a shifted vacuum. Yeah, but but what happens if you replace A by A plus one? Isn't that just equivalent to replacing N by N plus one? Yes. So it is convenient kind of, yeah, because some this kind of quotienting there by the integers that is not being made explicit because those are, it's not a, a it's not a uh, it's not a direct sum of distinct spaces is the quotient of that by the integer lattice. Because, exactly because well, of what you just said. Yeah. Well, but, but uh, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, there's a redundancy. Uh, somehow the basis state A comma N, it should be the same as A plus one comma maybe N, N or N minus one. I don't know, there, there's some equivalence there. No, I mean they are different states because they they are they have different eigenvalues of J zero, but ah, okay. they are indistinguishable from a monodromous point of view. I see. Okay. So I see. the the the, space, the the full space is is uh, the sum of all the spaces, uh, of all the Clifford modules mm -hmm. generated over these states. Okay. But they are all equivalent from the monodromy point of view. Okay. And. Uh, the other, these, these are where the fermionic fields. The other uh, type of field that we will that uh, we will consider is the vertex operator. And if you just look at this uh, bosonization formula, the analog of the bosonization formula, uh, it is defined in the same way as the fermion. But here I have some arbitrary parameter theta in all the exponents. So because of this arbitrary parameter theta, when I consider e to the theta q, e to the theta q uh, sends so e to the theta q sends, for example, the state a to the state a plus theta. So because of this factor, the uh, vertex operator does not act on H A, but is an intertwiner between the space H A and H A plus theta that are different if, uh, if theta is not integer. So this uh, was uh, that, we, that we, this that we just saw was the case of uh, one free fermion, but to uh, deal with isomonodromic problem, we have to uh, for in general, for an n by n linear system, we need a vector of n such fermions. And in the but case can of you, can you express uh, psi alpha or psi theta in terms of v theta? Uh, psi alpha, no, no, no. I wouldn't say. I mean, the usual in the usual non-twisted setting, the fermionic operator up to those factors that you've written, like e to the q and z to the j, um, is the vertex operator. I mean, you, you, you can go from one to the other. That's the bosonization. Uh, yeah, but this is a different vertex operator that, uh, than, than the one that is in the uh, integrable hierarchies, I would say. Oh. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the one that's in the integrable hierarchies doesn't have the spectral parameter here, no? Oh, yes, it does. You have it positive does. and negative. Uh, right. 
Oh, spectral. Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. Uh, oh, I see what you mean. Uh, I don't think that they can be. I mean, the, the, yeah, the yeah. V can, can of course, be expressed in terms of the Psi because you can express this. Uh, yeah, only uh, it's not Z. Uh, the Bose Fermi equivalence takes you from it takes you from the nth fermionic charge sector to the nth bosonic charge sector, which means there's an extra parameter. It's not Z, it's zeta to the power n. So it's not just symmetric functions of the uh, infinite number of uh, bosonic variables, but there's also an extra parameter. And I think that's what tells you which sector you're in. But you have something more general here with this twisting. Yeah, I wouldn't say that uh, they can be expressed in terms of the V theta. Because they have, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that. But um, yeah, as I was saying we, we need we will need the vectors of this free fermion. So in the two by two case, we have to consider a vector of two psi of z and two psi bar of z, and each one will have its own mode expansion with its with its own parameter a alpha. And so you have two copies of the Clifford algebra. Now, what was before the U1 hat algebra, because we had only one fermion bilinear, now becomes a GL2 hat algebra, which is generated by all the fermion bilinears of these uh, uh, different uh, free fermions that we have. And so the fermion charge is now uh, not just the integer as before, but we have uh, this vacuum charge here and the fermionic charge, which is a vector of two integers. And now the vector, the vertex operators will intertwine between two uh, spaces, which are again generated in the same way. So because now here we have two uh, free fermions, we will have that a state uh, is given by uh, a pair of partitions. So you have state YA, which would be some product of all the uh, psi alpha minus p i. So this is a product over i and over alpha. So alpha is equal to one, two. Same for psi. Alpha minus q i applied to a. And this a is, is again, it's a is a one, a two. So now the states are labeled by pairs of partition and the vertex operators intertwine between two such spaces. Um, with the only constraint that is the total charge conservation. So th these are much less constrained than, than before. And so these are the objects that we will be dealing with. Um, so now I will want to tell you about the, the main properties that we will use to establish our correspondence. But, uh, are there any more questions before that? Well, if not, uh, let me go on. So the first property, as of course advertised by the fact that I said conformal field theory at least a couple of times, is that we have conformal invariance for these free fermions. Now, conformal invariance is generated by the energy momentum tensor, which can be written in terms of the currents from before in this way, and its modes satisfy the uh, Virasoro algebra commutation relation. And here, this C will be equal to uh, N in general, in our case two, because we have, we have a one central charge for every free fermion, and here we have two free fermions. And we can consider this- In terms of the uh, fermionic- what? Can you give the L's in terms of the fermionic or the bosonic? Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, basically the, the J's are given in terms of fermion bilinear, and then you can write the L's in terms of uh, uh, also fermion bilinear, actually. So are the L's uh, bilinear in the J's? I guess so. They are bilinear in the J's, but then by using Witt's theorem, they are also bilinear in the psi. So this is a sort of Sugawara formula with the derivative term missing. 
Uh, I don't know what you mean by the derivative. Why is the derivative missing? Well, the Sugawara formula usually looks like j squared plus j primed. Uh, right. Uh, it has to do with the same process. I would say that uh, because no, I would say that the Sugawara formula that, that uh, I know is uh, that t is uh, j squared, normal ordered. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe the, this uh, this the this general Sugawara formula is also a linear term in j, which is proportional to the derivative of the current operator. Right. I think that uh, that comes from the normal ordering. Um, Maybe not. Uh, it's, but it's just a calculation. It's, it's true. Yeah. It's yeah. not the normal so, ordering, but it really yeah. it does affect the, uh, the central oh, I'm sorry. I'm going. But maybe let yeah. me step in. I, I'd like to ensure that Fabrizio has time to uh, present his whole talk. So just mm -hmm. uh, let's try to stick to the uh, main things and then let's not go on, off on tangents because I think. Right. So uh, the, the energy momentum tensor. Uh, can be uh, considered, can be obtained also from the short distance expansion, this is called OPE, of the free fermions. And uh, you see the, the first term is just a two-point function of the fermions, just a simple pole. Then you have these currents that were the normal order, so it's the regular part. And at subleading order, you get the energy momentum tensor. And because the energy momentum tensor generates is the generator of conformal transformation. Uh, if I consider a correlator of this type, and we will see the, uh, in the next slide uh, in terms of matrix element, what are these objects? Um, the uh, correlator with the insertion of the energy momentum tensor is related to the one without the insertion by this word identity. We have a double pole with this theta k squared and a simple pole with the derivative with respect to zk. And what are these uh, uh, correlators here? So in the case of the sphere, they're just the matrix elements. So for example, you have this uh, correlator with the vertex operator at infinity, one, t, and zero. I can always put three of them at infinity, one, and zero by conformal invariance. And this is just the matrix element like this. And actually, uh, the fact that this is a conformal block and not just a correlator means that here I have a space H A fixed. So what does this mean? It means that uh, uh, V theta T will be a map between theta H theta zero and H A, and then V theta one will be a map between H A and H theta infinity, and this A is fixed. So this is uh, uh, the meaning of a conformal block, that you have this intermediate, all these intermediate charges fixed. And uh, I can uh, consider uh, this geometrically as a sphere with four punctures, where the punctures are uh, the in insertion locations of these, uh, 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 of these vertex operators. And because the internal charges are fixed, I can consider this to be uh, given to be specifying a pants decomposition of the Riemann sphere. So here I have the insertion at the point zero t one and infinity and the gluing of the pants decomposition is just the insertion of an identity here in the conformal block because this is an identity on the space h a. And I want to introduce this notation with this is a conformal block diagram. And this will be nice because it will allow us to uh, uh, compute graphically all these monodromes. Block is defined as a trace over a Hilbert space of uh, uh, fixed uh, charge. And then the conformal block diagram is this one. So the other ingredient that we will need is the braiding properties of the, these free fermions with vertex operators. And uh, this means the following. 
that if we exchange uh, are related by a matrix, which is called the braiding matrix. And what this means is that I'm analytically continuing the, the free fermion, the conformal block past the vertex operators. And this is graphically represented in this way. And a similar statement holds for the other type of exchange that we can have with some other matrix B twilled. The point is that uh, and they are given by this some uh, explicit formula that uh, we can just write down. So these will be our building blocks for our monodromies. What are the and now I want, yes? You had those Fs, those are hypergeometric. What is that? Uh, so this is uh, the product of uh, these diagonal factors and these Fs. This matrix F is a two by two matrix given by these signs. Ah. Okay. So everything is explicit. Yeah. And now I want to show you how to compute monodromies by on the sphere and on the torus by just using these. So let's say that we have uh, this conformal block. So this I represent a fermion insertion I represent by a weekly line on the leg. Here it's close to zero. So because of the bosonization formula that we saw before. When I do this kind, this analytic continuation around zero, I just get this diagonal factor e to the two pi i theta zero sigma three. So let's see what happens if then I bring the fermion past theta t and then back. So when I give, put it, bring it past theta t, I get a matrix pt. And then, sorry, I don't want to uh, take up your time, but what does it mean? E to the two pi i is one. So psi of z, uh, I, I, we should think of it as not defined on the complex plane, but on some Riemann surface, I guess. No, but this is just a statement that you have a monodromy with monodromy exponent theta zero around zero. And okay. in this so normalization- so the Fermi fields themselves are multi-valued. So they're not single valued on the complex plane. Yes. But because these theta zeros are, are integers, they're not single valued on a, any infinite, any finite cover of the complex plane. They're just monodromies, uh, generic monodromies. And then when I go back here, uh, I get this matrix BT, twilde BT. So to show you a bit uh, better, what is what kind of contour I just did? Well, we start from here, and then the monodromy around zero was just this contour on the Riemann sphere. And uh, then the other contour that we did was this. We started here, uh, and then we did this contour, and we went past the theta t. And then we closed in this orientation the contour. So you see this is a monodromy around both zero and t. This bt will the bt. And in fact, if we just look at the expressions that we had before for these uh, two matrices, we see that this is in the conjugacy class of this A. So this A is our trace coordinate. We have uh, the relation trace of n0 and t is equal to uh, two uh, cosine of two pi a. And then we can compute uh, by in this way, the, the monodromy is around all the, all the punctures basically. Okay, so on the, on the torus, uh, if you want to do the same thing, uh, the a cycle monodromy is just uh, given by this intermediate channel a. And then if I want to do a B cycle monodromy, I have to cross the vertex operator once, and that's it, because here I'm not crossing anything else. So this braiding matrix is the B cycle monodromy in the torus case. And uh, yeah, I won't draw the contour because that's a bit uh, too much now. I want to show you how one gets from 
uh, using these uh, equations that we had, how one gets to the tau function. So what we have to consider is this uh, kernel that is constructed from the solution to the linear system uh, with the addition of this simple pole. And what are the properties of this kernel? So it has a simple pole in W equal to Z uh, with diagonal identity residue. And then you have the inverse monodromy representation on, in W and the monodromy representation on Z coming from the linear system. And the statement is that this is the psi bar alpha psi beta insertion with the vertex operators. And this is because uh, by construction, we have exactly the monodromy representation that we wanted from the linear system. The simple pole com comes from the singular expansion of the free fermions. And the psi bar has have the opposite monodromy representation with respect to psi, the inverse. So the way that one goes to the tau function is by uh, expanding this uh, kernel as uh, z close to w. And uh, on this side, uh, the leading terms are, are identically satisfied. And when we take the trace, the subleading term is one, just one half trace of a squared on this side. And on this side, you get this string of vertex operator with an energy momentum insertion. And then you use your Vira Zoro word identity that is up here. And so when, once you take, oh, here there's a plus. Once you take the residue, you see that I get a DZK log of the conformal block is equal to the residue of one half trace of a square. And here, th this is how one gets the identification in the case of the sphere. Now, in the case of the torus, Fabrizio, the main difference. Sorry, yes. could you remind us what's the relationship between the theta and the linear system? So these thetas are uh, exactly the monodromy exponents of the linear system. Because, yeah, so, uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I think, yeah, because I, I got interrupted, I got disconnected while I was explaining that. Uh, but on the torus, uh, yeah. how do you express the tau function in terms of the uh, k? The tau function in terms of the k. I mean, uh, the one Fred Holm determinant, isn't there? But that's a singular kernel. Yeah, no, but that's a different, uh, a bit of a different thing. Uh, it's not exactly the same k. Uh, this is not the, the Fredholm operator in the Fredholm determinant formulation. This is just the two-point function of the free fermions. Mm -hmm. They are related, but uh, not uh, this um, Here on the torus, the difference was that you had this uh, twisted monodromy representation on the B cycle. So if you want to construct this uh, same kernel uh, object in the torus case, you have to cancel these twists between the y and uh, of uh, to the minus one and the y. And so this is the generalization of the uh, y minus one y over z minus w. We have the simple pole given by this theta and then the numerator cancels the twist. So this again will have the monodromy representation, just the monodromy representation, not the twists acting on the left as inverse and on the right as uh, with the normal action. And uh, by construction, again, this uh, is given is the same as the two fermion two point function. Now, when we expand for Z close to W, we get uh, one half trace of S squared plus dot dot dot. And this is equal to the thing with the energy momentum insertion. And so uh, this dot, dot, dot extra, uh, the interesting thing about this dot, dot, dot extra is that it's a total derivative is a, uh, of, of uh, both in tau and of z case of the same thing. In the sense that if I integrate this, uh, uh, the Virasoro word identity and this left hand side, uh, if I take the residue at the k and I take an a, a cycle contour integral, 
I get this relation. So now the tau function that generates the Hamiltonian is not just a conformal block, but you have this extra factor, which is quite complicated because it has theta function of Q that satisfies that is essentially the Pandevi transcendent. And if I want to go to higher rank, um, then we have to include more twist parameters, et cetera, et cetera, but the equation is essentially the same. Then one can observe that this is a, a twisted fermion partition function of another set of free fermions that are twisted with these twist parameters Q alpha. And this is the general relation that holds also in the case of higher genus. And the, the point is that in higher genus, the construction is essentially the same because uh, this operation that we did on the fermion to get the monodromies, this braiding, was completely local. So the building blocks are the same. We just apply them to a more complicated pants decomposition. And, but then in higher genus, the formulas are not, the, the, this uh, expression for the conformal block is not as explicit as in the case of genus one or zero. So do I have any more time uh, or? Uh, I think I you, uh, you, you lost five minutes and I was asking too many questions. So Ferenc, can we give yeah, you- I agree. And yes, yeah, let's go for roughly uh, five minutes and then we'll- uh, Okay, thank you. Very good. So uh, yeah, uh, this is in general, the, the, the formula coming from CFT and uh, the nice thing is that we can recover this uh, this case of the torus uh, one point uh, one point to one point torus for example uh, one can write this actually completely ignore these rows because I didn't have these are like a u one b cycle monodromies but let's ignore them uh, for now not for now let's ignore them. So you have this uh, tau function is equal to the same factor if one computes it from the Fredon determinant approach. Uh, this same factor times this, and this is exactly the free fermion conformal block. But now uh, one has a different representation of this object as a uh, determinant of one minus this uh, integrable kernel. And this uh, y out and y in, you can just consider them uh, as being given by very explicit formulas because y in is just this uh, uh, matrix uh, defined in terms of hypergeometrics and y out is uh, defined through some conjugation in terms of y in. So you have this uh, very explicit determinant just in terms of hypergeometric functions. And then you can do its minor, you can perform its minor expansion. And what you get is these Nekrasov functions. You see, uh, I'm summing over uh, partitions and charges, and I get this. This M is the monodromy exponent at the puncture. This A is the monodromy uh, on the A cycle. Uh, and these uh, the terms in this expansion are just this is some ratio of bars to functions. And these are just some combinatorial factors uh, that depend on the arm and leg length of the Yan diagrams over which we are summing. And uh, together with uh, Harini Desiraju and Pasha Kavrilenko, we also derived this uh, same formula for the case of uh, the Garnier system. So not just one puncture torus, but many puncture torus. Uh, the explicit formula is still in the two by two case. There's a generalization for some cases in n by n, but I won't go into there. And um, yeah, so the, the, the point that uh, I want to mention is that there are these two objects. There's this tau function that generates the Hamiltonians, and then we have the conformal block itself. Uh, that, um, and the conformal block is a nice object while this tau function generating the Hamiltonians is clearly not. Although we, we can say some other things starting from it, but in general, this is a nice object. The other, the, the one that generates the Hamiltonian is not. And 
In fact, it might be that uh, this is a good uh, object to call the tau function in this case, because this is the object that satisfies bilinear equation, because this is expressed in terms of free fermions, and these bilinear equations are not known, but are certainly there just because it is a free fermion, free fermionic objects. Instead, the one that generates the Hamiltonians not necessarily satisfies bilinear equations. So if one just wants to define a tau function from the bilinear equation, then this is actually a better candidate than the one that, uh, that generates the Hamiltonians. And having said this, uh, the just some further direction is that uh, the higher genus generalization would uh, be very interesting because in uh, for genus greater than one, these conformal blocks do not have uh, such an explicit uh, expression like like uh, like this one. Such a such an expansion for the conformal block is not known. So if one generalizes the determinant approach to higher genus, one, one would get this expansion, not just for the tau function, but also new expansions for the conformal blocks, which would, which would be very interesting in uh, CFT. And uh, uh, this I didn't mention, but uh, if one does this, then it would be possible to generalize also to irregular singularities in higher genus, which is a completely unknown, uh, uncharted territory, almost completely uncharted territory, at least at this level. And the other thing that we're looking into is to study the modular properties of this tau function on the torus. Uh, that should be analogous to the problem of the connection constant to Pandev V6. So, uh, sorry, I went over time, uh, but thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so questions, please. We have time maybe one or two for one or two short questions well i have questions but i'd like to leave the floor for others Let's see you speak up if you have any question well if nobody else has a question i'll ask but i want to give a chance to others thank you can i ask a question um sure. th thanks for thanks for the talk um so who's speaking uh, oh this is alex uh so sorry can you hear me okay Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So thanks for the talk. Um, it, 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 you know, uh, you wrote down these reasonably explicit expressions for the free fermion conformal blocks um, mm -hmm. that you were using at the end of the talk. I was wondering, um, uh, uh, do you understand how these behave as analytic functions of the internal momentum uh, of the conformal block? Uh, right. So you, you had one point blocks on the torus and there's some dependence on the internal momentum of the operator running around in, in the torus. Do you understand how things behave as analytic functions of that parameter? It, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I'm a little buried. It's a little buried in these formulas. I can't quite. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what you would want to know are, for example, zeros and poles in A. Well, is it a meromorphic function? Does it have branch cuts? Is there Stokes phenomena? Uh, stuff like that. Right. Is this the kind of thing people know? I don't, I, I'm not too familiar with these expressions in terms of the Nekrasov partition functions. So, you know, speak to me as you would speak to a child. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let, let me let me think for a moment because the, the, the properties uh, in terms because this is a, a series expansion here is a bit buried, but uh, yeah. the, the the series expansion parameters the, the, is the time is e to the two pi i tau. Um, so yeah, so you're saying the coefficient of tau in that expression is the dimension, and uh, but there's a complicated summation appearing. Yeah, yeah because the, so okay. the, the actual structure, uh, if I write it in a bit more implicit form, the structure of this thing is some. Uh, uh, some Fourier series of some basic objects where these z of a plus n are some sums over partitions 
uh, of e to the two pi i tau n uh, z n, where these are just the partitions of size n. Uh, so you, you have these two types of uh, of sums. One is over the, the C, tau series, which is convergent for modules of uh, to the two pi i tau less than one, and the other one is this kind of Fourier series like mm -hmm. thing. Uh, in terms of a and uh, in terms of a, because you have this structure here, a is uh, uh, the a cycle monodromy. And eta is actually the Darboux conjugate coordinate in the character variety. Uh, you can get some uh, um, difference equations uh, for these mm -hmm. uh, in A and eta. Now, uh, Yorkov, uh, Lisovi, and Tiki, and then uh, later. Um, um, also with its and uh, Prokhorov uh, and a lot of other people uh, studied this uh, in the case of P6 and they studied the and, and the generalization on the sphere and they studied the connection uh, concept problem in this. But uh, this really stems from studying the behavior in terms of A and eta. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not that simple. It's, it's not... Uh, just straightforward from the expansion to, to read what was the behavior in A and eta. There's a bit okay. more like work right. that one has to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, could I slip in my question now or is there someone else who would like to ask? <laughs> yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I, <laughs> I see the formulas, beautiful, everything is well-defined. I guess there are a lot of parameters. The A's are mainly the parameters. And uh, what I'd like to know is <laughs> what does this solve? It, it, uh, so this is some elliptic tan of A6, but what is it exactly? How, you're on the ellipse. You, you only have one uh, pole in the... No, you can't have just one pole in the fundamental domain, or can you? Yes, you can. Is that um, what it is, just one pole? Yes, this this here is just one pole on the torus. Okay, and the and presumably there's still. I don't know, the, the, like there's four parameters in ordinary time of a six. Here there must be more parameters. So what are the parameters for which this is the solution? Yeah, but uh, thinking of of it in terms of uh, pan level six, I think it's a bit deceiving. Uh, because so in pan level six, there are four parameters uh, which are uh, either alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, so either alpha, beta. Actually, let me see if I can. Uh, I would like to have. Oh, never mind. I wanted to have something like a whiteboard. But, uh, either alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Or you can uh, see this as the four monodromy exponent, theta zero, theta one, theta t, theta infinity, which is more natural from what we discussed uh, here. And this gives you, give you the residue at the puncture. And then you have the two integration constant, which in our language would be a so and- you have a second order equation. It's a four parametric family of second order equations and there are two integrations. Yes. So that's clear. So yes. what is the analogous thing that you have solved? So here on the torus, uh, the case with one puncture, which is the case in which it's an ODE, because when you have more than one puncture, it becomes a system of, uh, of uh, differential equations. It's, uh, so you have just one puncture, so you have only one monodromy exponent, which is this n. And then you have the two integration constant, a and eta. Okay, so they're really just two integrations. And, and the equation is the one the, that uh, uh, calogero like uh, non-autonomous Calogero equation. Okay. So yes. are, are you saying this is the most general one punctured ellipse? Uh, to uh, rank two one punctured ellipse? 
or is there more? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. So uh, this is the number of parameters that this is the number of parameters that you need for a one puncture ellipse. Uh, now on the torus, time. you can have in equivalent bundles that give you different lux matrices, and you can do a gauge transformation, singular gauge transformation to pass between one and the other. But then and the, the, the equation, the isomonodromic deformation equation needs to be the same, or at least some canonical transformation. So this explicit uh, series formula uh, solves that uh, two-point elliptic Calogero moser system that you wrote down. So, uh, yeah, that is kind of what was a bit disappointing in these formulas. And that is why I would like to find a definition of uh, this tau function that only involves this. Because in the usual von Levick case, let me go back to this formula. So in the usual von Levick case, you have the tau function. And then you say, uh, if I study the tau function, I have the solution because it's just some logarithmic derivative of the solution. But here, the, uh, the tau function in the sense that it generates the Hamiltonian, uh, it's the determinant, the Fretton determinant, which is the conformal block, but you have this extra factor which depends explicitly on the solution. So, so you're saying that this point, the tau function does not solve the Keller-Germoser system? Completely. Yeah, not in uh, not in uh, in the same way that uh, you have uh, on the in the Panlevi case. The the only the closest thing that we have is a bit of a bit artificial, but uh, this is uh, what we were able to do. Uh, let me clear these red things. Erase link. So, if you uh, start with a bit of a generalization where the B cycle monodromy has also a U1 component parameterized by a row, this, this row here, then uh, we can show that if you take this row as uh, some free parameter that you can fix, um, the solution of the calogero moser equation is given by this determinant evaluated at rho equals to q. The zeros of, uh, yeah. The, the, so the, let, let me put it better. So let, let's write this equation like this. We have tau, uh, I'm writing at the bottom, tau theta one of q plus rho theta one of Q minus rho. This is uh, proportional to this uh, determinant. Now, if I set rho to Q, then the uh, left-hand side vanishes. And the, so the zeros, and because this uh, tau cm doesn't depend on rho, the, the determinant depends on rho. And these theta functions depend on rho. Uh, this is not clear from what I said, but uh, you'll have to trust me on this. Uh, so this means that if I evaluate this at rho equals to q, then the determinant must be zero. So the solution is the zero locus of the determinant in terms of rho. And the, a, a check of this statement is the following. Uh, are you still there? Yes. Okay. So now I'm always worried that I'm disconnecting. But a, a statement of uh, a check of uh, the statement is is this: that uh, if you take the isospectral limit of this equation of uh, this uh, determinant uh, of one plus k evaluated at rho equals to q is equal to zero, then what you get is the uh, solution of the elliptic culture in terms of theta functions. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the solution to that equation, uh, the, the krichever novikov uh, solution type uh, of the isospectral system, uh, that the solutions of the isospectral system is the zeros of 
the sum theta function. And here, the solution is a zero of tau function in the isomonotromic case. OK, so I think uh, there was a uh, sort of an answer uh, to this question. Maybe this is a natural point to, uh, to finish. And if there is a uh, more detailed discussion, this can follow here or somewhere else. So thank you very much again. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.